Welcome everybody um, to our virtual uh, Friday virtual history program. My name is Jillian Storms and I'm co-chair of the Research and Publications Committee of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Uh, in 2020, uh, Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation partnered to host these virtual histories as our way to supplement income loss from the pandemic. So we very much thank, this is Baltimore Heritage's site and their link and Baltimore Architecture Foundations. And um, I'm also joined by uh, Margaret from um, the Baltimore Architecture Foundation, and she can put those links into the chat at one point. Um, but uh, I want to very much think, uh, thank everybody who donated today. Your uh, support enables us to continue these talks. Now, just a few announcements before we start. Um, this program will be recorded and available on the Baltimore Architecture Foundation's YouTube site. And again, Margaret will put those in the chat, uh, that, that link in the chat for those of you on the call. Um, on Friday, September 9th, please join us for our next virtual history, which is on the evolution of the Hopkins retrospective. Um, we are gonna have public historian and archivist, Allison Seiler, I think I'm pronouncing her name right, um, who's gonna detail the evolution of this program at Hopkins University, um, which tries to draw lessons from the past and look forward to the university's collective future. We also want to invite you all uh, to our last happy hour of the summer, um, where you can come visit, meet staff and um, board members and everybody who uh, might be volunteering for our next program, Doors Open Baltimore, and see our wonderful headquarters in um, the base of the Mies Building. The Doors Open program is going to be the first um, weekend in October, October 1st and 2nd, and we'll provide a link also in the chat to that where lots of buildings will be open for you to see and there'll be individual tours on Sunday. Um, led by uh, historians and uh, architects, so it will be fascinating. Hope you can join us. Now on to today's presentation. It's kind of exciting for me because this is a long um, drawn out process from when we first uh, started looking at the early women of architecture in Maryland, um, having discovered there was nothing compiled on that history. And um, we have, uh, were able to secure a grant with the Maryland Historic Trust to actually take the earlier work that we had done on research and really look and deeply explore um, the women's work in this state. And um, uh, Traceries was hired on, EHT Traceries was hired on um, to do that. And they've completed that first uh, um, initial work and 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 um, and so we have John Gentry on the call, who is going to give this presentation. He's a senior architectural historian with them, um, does historic preservation consulting in Washington D.C. and around the region, um, and holds a bachelor's of arch arts in history from DePaul University and a master's of historic preservation from the University of Maryland College Park. So. Um, this, uh, the other exciting part of uh, today's talk is that Dahlia Hirsch, Poldy's oldest daughter, is going to be on the talk. And um, let me see, I don't, um, if you could share your, uh, John, if you could share the first slide that you have, just so that when I talk, it, it's up um, what the talk is on today, because I don't think I have that in my set. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and do that now. But today's, uh, but today's talk is actually focused on Poldy Hirsch, who was an architect um, who primarily worked in Harvard de Grace, Maryland. And we have her daughter also on the panel who can help answer questions. So it's kind of exciting. Um, I love it when we do these where we have people who actually uh, knew the folks we're talking about. Um, if you have any questions, please add them um, to the Q&A box and um, Margaret will read them off at the end of the talk and we will be able to answer your questions. So um, take it away, uh, John, thank you. Okay, thank oh. you, Julian. Okay. I'm uh, my screen. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as Julian said, my name is John Gentry. Uh, I am a senior architectural historian with EHT Traceries Incorporated. 
And I'm joined here today by my colleagues, uh, Sarah Bonish and Laura Hughes. Uh, today, we're gonna to be discussing the life and work of Harford County architect, Poldy Hirsch, looking at her career as a female architect uh, in Maryland during the 1960s, uh, her design philosophy and influences and her principal works. Uh, we're going to focus particularly on the Hirsch family residence in Harvard de Grace, pictured here, which was completed in 1970. And this is a great uh, Baltimore Sun photo uh, that accompanied an article on the house that was published in 1973. Uh, last week, uh, we presented our efforts to document uh, women architects in Maryland uh, through the preparation of the National Register of Multi-Property Documentation Form, Women in Maryland Architecture, 1920 to 1970 on behalf of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation and the Maryland Historical Trust. The National Register Program is a program administered by the US Department of the Interior National Park Service in tandem with state and local officials to identify, evaluate and protect America's historic and archeological resources. And the National Register is the official list of the nation's historic places. In an MPDF, the themes, trends, and patterns of history shared by a group of related properties, such as buildings in Maryland designed by women, were organized into historic contexts, and the property types that represent those historic contexts are defined. The MPDF is a cover document and not a nomination in its own right, but it serves as the basis for evaluating the National Register eligibility of related properties. The Hirsch Residence is the first woman designed architectural resource in Maryland to be nominated for listing in the National Register of Historic Places under the MPDF. Poldy Hirsch was one of several European born <clears throat> or trained architects who practiced architecture in Maryland during the post-war period. Others that we documented during the course of the MPDF research include Melita Roddick and Nezahat Arikalu. Poldy Hirsch was born in Remscheid, Germany in 1926. With the rise of fascism in Germany, her family moved to Israel. There, she studied at the country's number one technical university, the Technion School for Engineering, Math, and Architecture in Haifa. After the war, Poldy Hirsch earned a degree in architecture from the University École Polytechnique in Lausanne, Switzerland, graduating in 1953. Poldy Hirsch moved to the U.S. with her husband and daughter in 1953. She worked for one year as an architect in the Sweckley, Pennsylvania office of Bradley, Patterson, and Bergner. The Hirsch family eventually settled in Haverty Grace, where her husband, Dr. Gunther Hirsch, started a medical practice. Poldy Hirsch received a Maryland architect's license in 1962 and established an independent practice in Haverty Grace. She became a member of the Baltimore chapter of the AIA in 1964. Hirsch primarily focused on residential and commercial commissions in and around Haverty Grace. Her work blends West Coast and European approaches to modernism, tempered with an awareness of the social dimension of residential design and was featured in the Baltimore Sun. Poldy Hirsch retired in 1980 due to declining health. She died in 1987. And the photo at right of Poldy was graciously provided by her daughters, uh, Dahlia and Elaine. And we really appreciate uh, all their uh, contributions to our research and uh, sharing a lot of great information and stories about Poldy and her work. So here we're looking at uh, a school design that Poldy Hirsch uh, prepared while in school in Switzerland in the 1950s. Uh, her architectural training was heavily influenced by the work of, of other, other uh, early European modernist architects, such as Le Corbusier, uh, and she believed that buildings should, quote, be built well and organized, and that their design should be original rather than copying styles of the past. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a design for a primary school that uh, she prepared while she was in school in Switzerland, most likely in the early 1950s. And here we can see that she was already working out uh, some of the uh, forms and approaches to massing and materiality <clears throat> that characterized her later work in Maryland during the 1960s. Um, as you can see here from the drawing, you know, uh, the design exhibits a, a low kind of modernist form, <clears throat> has a really nice slanted roof line and uh, curtain walled uh, glazing. 
uh, divided by thick mullions. Uh, but as seen in the Hirsch residence in Hafford of Grace, she's also contextualizing already at this early period with the surrounding landscape through the use of natural stone cladding and the rustic wood deck that you can see there at the second story. And she's also locating the, the building well in the landscape, uh, as you can see uh, from, the, uh, from the sections. Here's another uh, design by Polly Hirsch from her, from her school days. It's a theater design. Uh, and you can see here the emphasis uh, on, on kind of a modern sleek exterior in keeping with the period, it's very functional. We're seeing a very horizontal emphasis in the massing at street level uh, and it right as a floor plan for the building. So when Hirsch and her family settled in Harvard Grace, she <clears throat> embarked on a career as an architect, which was unbelievably difficult at that time for women in the US. <clears throat> and she encountered quite a bit of difficulty in finding uh, commissions early on in Harvard Grace. According to her husband, Dr. Gunther Hirsch, as a woman architect, she was considered quote, an oddity. Uh, and she encountered great difficulty in finding clients. Uh, at one point, she even considered abandoning her career, uh, but she adapted to these challenges and she undertook the financing, design and construction of numerous smaller projects around town. Uh, she primarily designed residential projects early on in her career <clears throat> from single family dwellings to small duplex townhouses intended to serve working class families. Uh, she started out designing small speculative houses like the example we see here, uh, employing a crew of local carpenters and turning over each house one at a time. Uh, pictured here is an example located at 729 Tidings Road in Haverty Grace, which was completed in 1961. Uh, her speculative houses were functional, they were affordable, and they were also uh, uniform in design. So here's a, here's a really nice photograph of the Hirsch family uh, taken during the early 1960s while on a ski vacation. Uh, the ideas of health, family life, and their relationship to architecture and design were key principles uh, that were of interest to both Poli and her physician husband. Uh, one of Polly Hirsch's first projects in Maryland was <clears throat> for the design of a medical office building for her husband at 131 South Union Avenue in 1962. Uh, she designed a second story to the building circa 1980 to, to accommodate the medical practices of her daughters. The design combines a modernist box-like form and ribbon wood windows with an unusual entrance canopy. Hirsch designed the interior spaces from the waiting room to the medical suites to meet uh, the requirements of her, of her physician husband, Gunther. Uh, the building reflects their European outlook regarding health and wellness, and it actually features a basement sauna that was designed in Finland, which is kind of cool, uh, which was really a novelty in Haver de Grace at that time. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we're really fortunate to have <clears throat> many of Poldi's original drawings uh, which illustrate her iterative approach to design. Hirsch would begin with a rough conceptual sketch and pencil uh, and would then develop that concept through multiple versions of refinement. She would follow the same process for both exterior of the building and interior spaces. Uh, from these early concepts, Hirsch would move on to floor plans and more formal sketch renderings, refining these as she went until she, until she had produced a final set of drawings bearing, bearing her Maryland State Architectural License stamp. Poldy Hirsch always produced many iterations of the plan with function in mind, and she considered from the outset options for later expansion or the rearranging of functions within a given design. And here we have another sketch that she did for the waiting room that kind of uh, shows this approach that I, that I was speaking about. Uh, you can see she's, and, and there are a number of these in, in her collection of drawings for this project, where she was going through, she was trying out different ideas, she was trying out different configurations for the interior spaces. And so this is a great example of that. I actually, um, can I just interrupt? My first office yeah, sure. was in that office building. 
and it was downstairs in the basement, she literally drew more than four different options. Like it confused me. She's like, well, if you want to go in this way, but then you might expand, but then Barry might take the back office. So she was always, she never thought there should be one design. She thought that was a lazy way to do architecture. It's very insightful. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for adding that. So here's another, here's another drawing that was provided by the Hirsch family for, for a design that, that Poldy uh, prepared for, for the Harford County Jewish Center in Haverford Grace during the 1960s. Uh, and you can see the parallels to some of her earlier school projects that we looked at, such as the, such as the school design we looked at. Uh, the design here combines uh, the modern curtain walled elevations that were so prominent during the period with stone cladding and very typical angular roof lines that were also kind of in vogue at that time. Unfortunately, this building was never constructed. Uh, the duplex residences designed by Poldy Hirsch, located in and around Hefford of Grace, exhibit a modern minimalist style with flat roofs, simple box shaped forms. Uh, and pictured here is 715 Lewis Street in Hefford of Grace, which was built in 1963. It's one of several other examples in town designed by Poldy Hirsch that are similar in style. And here are some drawings for, for those uh, duplex buildings. Uh, we've got uh, floor plans and elevations here. Uh, Poldy and her uh, physician husband, Dr. Hirsch, uh, were interested in improving the health of housing through design and aspects such as the allocation of interior space in a systematic and interrelated manner the use of durable materials and maximum exposure to sunlight for living spaces. It's all intended to create a healthy living environment at low cost. Uh, and uh, scholars have written about Poli Hirsch and her work, uh, notably Italian architectural historian, Selena Bagnara Milan, who published an article uh, several years ago for a conference. Uh, in it, she noted that Hirsch's duplex buildings reflect the design solutions developed by Le Corbusier in France for his high-rise buildings during the 1940s. Uh, Poli Hirsch admired Le Corbusier and uh, she was also very fond of the Lewis Sullivan maxim, form follows function, which was her guiding philosophy. This is, <clears throat> this is 607 Giles Street in Haverford Grace. Uh, and it's one of the uh, of a handful of very special custom designed residences from the 1960s that uh, Poli designed, in which she adopted a vernacular expression of modernism uh, that merged technology with tradition and craft and its use of natural materials. These houses combined strong geometries of form with bold colors uh, and an approach that was attuned to local conditions, uh, site characteristics natural lighting and ventilation. Uh, as I mentioned, pictured here is a custom modernist house that she designed for her parents. Uh, and it's located next door to the Hearst residence, which we're gonna take a look at uh, in a few moments. At, and it's located at six or seven Giles Street in Haverford of Grace. Uh, the house was completed in 1961, nine years before the Poldy and Dr. Gunther Hirsch residence at 605 Giles, uh, but it's very similar in design as we'll see. Uh, it's very interesting. The house has a fallout shelter in the basement and it's connected to the Hearst residence next door at 605 Giles by an underground passage, which is a very novel feature. Well, uh, I might add that it was built around the time, the bomb shelter was put in around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, when old people like me used to be told at school what to do in case of that missile hitting and what we were supposed to do in the hallway. So we had this bomb shelter uh, that I actually remember helping my mom, you know, stock with water and all the things. I actually had a little separate room where you put a Geiger counter up into the air to see if the radiation was low enough to then exit the bomb shelter. It's kind of crazy. It certainly is, but it's an interesting feature of the house. It is. Um, and an interesting story. Thank you. So here, here's another view. Uh, this is the interior of 607 Giles Street. Uh, note the natural daylighting, which is a strong feature of all of her, of her uh, residential designs and, and the warmth of the wood and the materials used in the interior. Uh, and you can see it right in the image as a, as a, as a design element that I, I really, I'm really fond of. 
It's a wood and frosted glass screen, which is a very elegant design solution that she implemented to separate the entrance hall from the living room. Uh, each room has natural lighting, uh, direct and indirect lighting, and is designed for acoustics as well as light. Uh, this is a drawing that Hirsch did for a house that's located just to the north of the Hearst residence and the house we just looked at, which she designed for her parents on Giles Street. Uh, she designed this for her brother. It was completed in 1968, and it's located at 610 Lafayette Street in Haverford Grace. And as, as with her parents' house and with the Hearst residence, you can see a lot of her kind of trademark design, uh, uh, design elements here incorporated into this. And just a great drawing as well. Uh, the Hirsch family residence at 605 Giles Street, <clears throat> completed in 1970, is considered to be Poldy Hirsch's masterpiece. It's among one of the best examples of mid-century modern uh, design in Harford County. The house, as you can see here in this Baltimore Sun photo, has a low-pitched roof with exposed steel rafters, makes use of extensive glazing. Uh, the use of natural stone and wood as a primary exterior cladding materials harmonizes well with the wooded suburban landscape. The attached carport, which is just off image to the right, uh, exhibits functional modern lines. <clears throat> uh, Pulley Hearst designed the house to serve many functions. Uh, first, it was the primary residence of, of the family, uh, including Dr. and Mrs. Hirsch and their three daughters. The design also accommodated their professional spheres, including an office and studio for Poldy, a patient treatment room for Dr. Hirsch. Poldy was able to incorporate these uses in a way that gave the family flexibility to partition off the professional life from the more private sphere and open them all up when, design, when desired. So there's a lot of flexibility that's, that's built into the plan uh, so that it can function you know, in, in multiple ways. Uh, which is also kind of a, a hallmark of, of modernism. And we will, we will see this as we, as we do our walkthrough here in the, in the next few slides. Hey, John. Yes. Just looking at the house in general and going back to my dad saying that my mom was kind of an oddity. Um, what I remember at, when at her funeral was her builder uh, coming and saying, you know, when I started building this house because she imported the, um, the beams that go through the entire house, these, these long beams, they had to come from California. And as he was putting those beams up, the other builders in the county were driving by because it was so odd and saying to him, uh, hey, you can't put a house like that up. You can't just put the beams up first. You have to build it from the bottom up. That house is gonna fall down because they'd never seen a house constructed um, in that fashion. They'd never seen a mid-century modern home with uh, California beams. It's a cool story, and it just underscores, you know, how how novel and unique this was uh, for Hever de Grace at the time that she was designing there. So this is a, this is another great Poldy Hearst drawing. This is a, a mid stage concept design for the Hearst residence. Uh, elements such as the complex sloping roof with with uh, wide overhangs, uh, the Claro story windows, and the extension of the side elevations to screen the front porch area remained in the final design. Uh, and as I mentioned, the house was unlike anything else being designed in Haverford Grace at the time and still really stands out when you visit the town and ride around. Uh, this is a current view of the front elevation. Uh, you can see the similarities to the conceptual plan we just looked at. Uh, as Dahlia mentioned, the house is clad in a combination of California redwood and local stone, and it incorporates large modernist windows and sliding glass doors. Uh, it communicates the influence of the so-called California style, as well as the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian houses. At Wright is the, is the uh, cantilevered sun deck with a, red, with a redwood privacy blind. The house also features an unusual exterior closet that you can see on the front porch painted yellow uh, that extends into the interior entrance hallway. Uh, the original door was neutral wooden color uh, it was painted uh, purple by Dr. Hirsch after Poldy Hirsch's death. Uh, this is a rear view of the house. Uh, Poldy Hirsch believed that each side of a building should be as aesthetically pleasing as the front. And that really uh, comes across here. Uh, it's just a, 
a very uh, a very refined, uh, very mature design uh, that uh, is strong each elevation. Now to the interior. This is a view looking west from the entrance hallway with a living room in the distance. Uh, the built-in wardrobe that we mentioned a moment ago extends to the outside front porch uh, where it contains a small slot and shelves for storage. This element embodies mid-century ideals seamlessly connecting the interior with the exterior. And this is an original uh, conceptual sketch that Poldy Hirsch did for that uh, entrance hallway that we just looked at. Again, pointing to her design approach where she would, where she would work out uh, both the exterior and the exterior designs through like multiple versions of sketches. Uh, here we're looking at a view, uh, uh, looking east from the living room. Uh, the metal hearth with tiled fire back is an, is an original feature, but it was added after the completion of the house due to permitting delays. Uh, Poldy felt that it was important to place the hearth near the center of the house. Uh, the tiles are believed to have been imported from Europe, and they uh, resemble a very, a very novel and interesting uh, uh, design that's uh, reminiscent of Mayan glyphs. Uh, the dining room area is at left, and as you can see, the open plan layout uh, really allows the interior spaces to flow into each other. Uh, it's a technique that was mastered by Frank Lloyd Wright in his residential designs. Uh, the large windows allow for emerging of the interior and outdoor environments. The tall ceilings were designed and calculated for good acoustics. Poldy Hirsch loved music and the practical touches for family living, such as a laundry chute. Uh, there is a built-in ironing board that, that uh, retracts from a, a, a special niche in, in the wall. Uh, the house has large, deep closets and a centrally located kitchen. That was um, that fireplace was another bit of a challenge because the permitting people in uh, Haverhill and Harford County had never seen a freestanding fireplace like that, nor had they heard of uh, tiles that were rated. Uh, against fire that could be freestanding tiles. They'd only seen fireplaces that kind of back up to a wall. It took her, and this was like before they had those kind of fireplaces. So she actually had to have the fireplace built to her specifications. Um, and then she had to convince the, the zoning or the permitting people that these were special tiles that indeed could handle a fireplace. So um, nothing hung there, but a sort of like a cardboard thing for several years until she could get it the way, permitted the way she wanted it. It's an interesting story. And it's, a, it's, it's when you visit the house, it's really one of the standout uh, elements of the interior and, and very unique. So here we're looking at the kitchen. Uh, it's lit by a large sliding glass window that you can see there at right and also the clearest story windows from above resulting from the slanted roof line that we, st that we saw from the exterior photos. Uh, it also features uh, original olive green Paul Macabre cabinets, which is amazing that they have survived. And here's a photo of Poldy Hirsch in the kitchen uh, circa 1970s. Uh, this is a view of the first floor study uh, you can see the stained cedar wood ceiling and the open light filled layout resulting from the clear story windows and other glazing. And you can also see the warmth of the materials really shine through here, a lot of wood and stone and natural materials in the house. Uh, the Hirsch family home and the family were highlighted in a Baltimore Sun article in 1973. Sun writer Helen Henry called the house, quote, a striking spread of redwood, stone, and glass, and quote, something of a showpiece in Haver de Grace. This is a picture that accompanied the article, and it shows Poldy Hirsch at right, uh, sitting with her black poodle in her lap, uh, and she is with uh, a guest in the basement playroom, and this is in 1973. Uh, the basement level contained the playroom, her architectural studio, as well as an office, an emergency treatment room for her husband, entered via separate bedroom uh, basement entrance. Uh, her daughter's bedrooms were located upstairs in the east wing with a private entrance. 
Another key aspect of the conceptual planning was to create a space for the display of the Hirsch's uh, large art collection. And here is some art uh, by Poldy Hirsch. Uh, Poldy and Gunther Hirsch not only collected art, but they also started the Havre de Grace Art Festival in 1963. Uh, during its heyday, almost 400 artists from all over the country came to Havre de Grace to exhibit and to sell their work. Uh, Poldy was a talented artist in her own right. And here are some examples of her work shared by her daughter, Dahlia. Can I speak to, to uh, sure. what you're saying? Uh, not just the art, but it just so happened. I was actually looking for something else today and I happened to find this book in the basement of uh, letters that people had written to the family after my mother passed because she was, she was only 60 when she passed. 60. And uh, there was just this paragraph which spoke to the fact that they were very involved in the community and art and opera. Um, so just one little paragraph said, um, you know, it's Dear Gunther, it's a long letter. And it says, although an architect, your home on Giles Street did not become a tribute as a structure, but rather a home that witnessed many joyous occasions, a center of cultural activity in Harford County, and lastly, a thing of beauty. I thought that was really cool that I happened to find that this morning. Um, and then uh, someone else, because I just remembered how meticulous she was and how she was actually her own contractor. She was the builder, the contractor, as well as, you know, was an artist and the architect. And uh, this was written, I tried to look this guy up. His name was Mr. Veal and he uh, what, owned a lumber yard and he started one of the, the first Hartford County Bank. Um, and one of the things he said, um, Poldy was a grand lady and highly respected for her business and professional ability and her integrity in the community. She was exacting, thorough and meticulous in all her endeavors and admi I admired her and shall not forget her. I thought this spoke to what you were saying. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Uh, this is a photograph of Poldy Hirsch at work in her basement studio. Uh, in placing her studio in the basement, her separated work functions from the more private family spaces in the home. Among the many conveniences designed by Hirsch for the house was a chute uh, that she used for sending items from upstairs office to a draftsman. Uh, that she employed in the basement studio. And this is another sun photo uh, from 1973 showing the front elevation. And we can see here Poldy's business sign uh, in the front yard. So it really was uh, a home and a home studio in the truest sense. Uh, here, here we see Poldy sitting on the back patio uh, near a small goldfish pond that's located at the rear of the house, uh, uh, just enjoying a quiet moment with her, with her pet. You can see there the, the rustic stone cladding that extends across the back elevation and also the side elevations as well. And it's local. <clears throat> uh, uh, Dolly, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's, it's local stone that was uh, procured there uh, in Harford County, and the masonry work was done by a local local builder, I believe. It is local stone, and what I remember, because my, my grandfather um, also was helping her build it, but what I remember is that they laid the entire, the big wall, which is perpendicular to the wall you're seeing, they actually laid the entire wall out on the ground, because it wasn't like any random stone placement. She wanted it exactly the way she wanted it, so it was all laid out flat before they started putting it vertical. It was time consuming, exacting. So in conclusion, Poli Hirsch was among a small number of pioneering female architects practicing in Maryland after World War II. Uh, this was a period when women constituted a very small percentage of the nation's professional architects. Women architects such as Poli Hirsch faced numerous roadblocks in advancing their careers in what was at the time still a male dominated profession. Hirsch, educated in Switzerland prior to immigrating to the US with her family after the war, established a successful career as an architect in Havre de Grace during the 1960s through her talent and determination. 
The Hearst Residence is an enduring statement in mid-century modern residential design. In designing the Hearst Residence, uh, the modern dwelling for her family, Poldy Hirsch incorporated a variety of modern movement influences, ranging from the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, the international style, the West Coast vernacular and West Coast vernacular architecture. Uh, Hirsch, in tandem with her, with her physician husband, sought to improve the living conditions and help the families through her residential design. As discussed in the introduction, the Hirsch residence is the first property in Maryland to be nominated to the National Register of Historic Places under the Women in Maryland Architecture multi-property documentation form. The Hirsch residence is significant under National Register Criterion A uh, for its place in the historic uh, context of women architects in Maryland after World War II. And under National Register Criterion C as an important example of modern residential architecture in Harford County. The nomination is scheduled to be considered at the October meeting of the Governor's Consulting Committee on the National Register. And if approved, it will then be forwarded to the National Park Service for listing in the National Register. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, we have had one question that's come in. So folks, please do post questions if you have them. And I have one question, which I'll give after this one. But um, Lena Woods asked uh, that the house looks like some of the houses in Pikesville, Maryland, and wanted to know if Poldy had any work in Pikesville. And I don't believe so. Did you discover anything? Not that I'm aware of, no. Well, what's interesting about that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. because she couldn't really get any large projects or government projects initially as a woman, there was an architect, gosh, I wish I could remember his name, who lived in Pikesville. I remember because he had a roundhouse because we visited there. And she did some of the design for him but he used his name, not her name. I remember hearing that as a kid because that was just the way it was. And then she realized she was never going to have her name on her own stuff unless she practiced by herself and my dad and she started you know, with her building the apartments and spec houses. Right, she was her own developer. I mean, that's what's right. actually quite novel of all the women we studied is she did it all but she had to do it all because it was very hard to get employment. But it wouldn't um, surprise me if you see some of her influence in some of the Pikesville homes because she did work for him and did some of his designs, but I know her name wasn't on any of those homes. So there's two other women who did practice modernist architecture, Nisa Hot, um, Arco Blue, I always say her name wrong, I'm, most apologies, but um, she was Turkish and she came and she was here primarily in the 60s. Um, and, and Ida Webster, and we know of a house of hers in um, Pikesville, but we, it's really hard coming across and being able to name the architects of projects we see, in, um, and, and it was very difficult for women in particular um, to be known, uh, even if they had their own firm, sometimes they couldn't get the commission, so, um, which is why I actually wanted to ask a little bit about that, because one of the things that I thought was so strange when I was studied is that there were only a handful of women doing this at the time. I mean, I thought we were going to discover a whole lot and, and not that there weren't, but there's just that we were only able to discover the names of women who had firms because everybody else gets lost. They don't get named. And um, so one of the things that um, in the end, we put together an exhibit, the Baltimore Architecture Foundation put together an exhibit on the early women of architecture in Maryland. It's still traveling. It has one other location. I think it has to go to Washington State, but it was sort of put on hold, uh, Washington County, but it was put on hold by the pandemic. I've made it a policy to get it in every county where the women had work. So, um, but anyway, uh, they, the thing that um, I thought was interesting is uh, Shirley Kennard, who practiced in the 70s and um, just passed away a couple of years ago, and um, Helen Staley, who, who's still living um, and practiced during that time, and your mom didn't seem to know each other. And so when we had the exhibit, we had her, your dad was living at the time, and we had them all get together, and we have a shot of them all together. Um, and I just found it fascinating that it took this whole study to even get them to be in the same room and know of each other because 
I guess back then without the internet and oops, you're on mute now, Dahlia. You're you're muted. Can't hear you. There you go. It's just there. seriously amazing what you have done to bring all of this to light because I, as her oldest daughter, had no idea her place in history. You know, from a perspective of a daughter, all I realized was the difficulties and how many hours she worked and how she like, you know, and how the uh, workmen would argue with her when she wanted the wires exactly the way she wanted them laid out. So, you know, she died pretty young, relatively young. And if it weren't for you, we well, wouldn't know. Well, I didn't even know that they had written about her in the Italian journal till there was actually, they met an Italian family uh, just by accident who like became like relatives to us, like in their later travel years. And they sent um, a friend of theirs, family friend who's an architect over to study with my mom. And they're from Italy. And he sent me the articles that were written in the Italian journals about my mom. So it's just, um, yeah. it's just an amazing story that hopefully she senses in some way. So we have a question um, from Christopher who said, what is the structure model shown in the last slide? It appears to be a small peristyle element. So this would be a question, John, do you have your last slide that you could show? Uh, I will try to share the screen again. <laughs> Let's hope this works. Let me try this again. I know uh, Jean says the light in the houses is beautiful. Did Poldy write about the way she viewed the role of light in her buildings? Oh, so that's the last slide. Oh, okay. I guess you have to race through them to get to the end. <laughs> We'll, go, we'll have a little mini. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the presentation again. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. You guys see that? Yeah, it's a good question about the model. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what we've not been able to identify the building. So if anyone thinks they may know what this is in, in and around Harford County, we'd, we'd love to we'd love to hear from you. Well, she looks very young there. Mm -hmm. And and I may not don't have. think that's our final home. So this could be something that she was still designing, you know, when we were in Swickley, Pennsylvania, when she first immigrated here, that she did for the company she worked for. That would be like um, one of my thoughts. And as far as light, I don't know. She didn't do a lot of writing, but I can tell you that even as a, a kid who has nothing to do with architecture, she pointed out to us that every room should have direct light, indirect light, and natural light in every single room. And she managed to accomplish that. It was that acoustics that she pointed out and also recognizing where the sun came up and down so that the height, actually my roommate from college, I saw where her note to me, she said, she taught, your mom taught me so much, but one of the things that stood out was how she showed me that the sun comes exactly up in the height of her balcony is exactly right so she can sunbathe nude without anyone seeing her outside in the summer and inside in the winter because the light comes into the room and the sunshine. There yeah, having is. been in her home, so they, the lighting is, the light I think is one of the most beautiful features. It's just gorgeous and because it, it's also the indoor outdoor connection. Um, we do have another question oh, here. Yeah. Um, who owns the house now um, for where Poldy, uh, the one that's been nominated. Um, they were wondering if it was chance of being turned into a house museum. I think the owners are very happy with the place. They in fact might've done an art Airbnb at one point, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, we, we were really lucky um, twice um, because you know they sent us a special note um, that they would like the house and it was a little less than we had asked for. You know, after my dad died, it was determined that um, none of us, we all had, you know, medical practices, none of us could really do a museum. Um, and we were selling the house. And then this young couple wrote us a, a note, which we, my nephew found the note because we didn't do messengers at the time. And they implored us to sell them the house for a little cheaper because the girl Greta uh, said that since she was a little girl, eight years old, she'd always wanted a mid-century modern home. Turns out she had never lived in a mid-century modern home, but somehow she knew that since she was eight years old. <laughs> and she now refinishes mid-century modern um, furniture and sells it out of the home. And they could not be better stewards of the home, just amazing. And then uh, 
my sister and I kept the house next door, which was the one you saw the grandfather's house. We couldn't convince any of our kids to move back to Haverty Grace to, to own it. And we, it was with real trepidation. We had a renters, you know, and that comes with its own difficulties of having renters. And we just sold it. And Greta told us that we couldn't have sold it to better stewards of that house. They love it. They're not changing anything. They're not updating the bathrooms or anything. They love is this, everything. Is this 607 Giles? Yeah. So we, Yes, we're they're on the call. And days. they said they love it. And yes, the fallout shelter is an excellent compliment to an interesting and beautiful home. Yeah. So I mean, I noticed of, Greta we, was on too. And if we didn't say it in the beginning, big thanks so we, to the current owner, we owners not for opening up the house. Better yeah. stewards of the house and the architecture. And it, it just, it makes me so happy and warms my heart that they are living there. We did have um, uh, somebody who gave a little uh, plug. The stone was from Quarryville. And the architecture firm you were trying to think of was Tartar and Kelly. I know I had tea on like the, I was like, t -t -t -t. so thank you. It was Tartar and Kelly. And I think it was Tartar that had a round house with the living room in the middle. Yeah, I know. And, and I, she actually, I think they also did a study with that firm uh, on some public housing that was in Baltimore. We really did have a hard time finding anything outside of the uh, Hartford County area and i don't think her, her work with them was one of them area. yeah um let's see is there any list of poldy hirsch's house they're gorgeous okay so yeah we should get a listing i know um they're gonna have um the 250th anniversary of her of hartford county and maybe for that we'll put out a listing and uh so people who want to do their own self-driving tour can do that of her homes um, some are very modest, but you know, when you, the one thing that struck me was that like those duplexes, when we first were trying to figure out her homes, I, I just want to share the story. I, if folks could tolerate me saying one more thing, but, um, we did, we only found about Poldy because of the woman who's the one who collects all the mid-century furniture. She put it on her website, woman architect. And it came up when we were doing just a search of the internet. And so it was like, Poldy Hirsch, okay. And then we found about the medical arts building and it had, you know, all your names on it, but you all retired. And so we were calling and we couldn't get anybody. And then finally I looked to see if there was a Hirsch that was an architect and found um, your sister's husband, who's a practicing architect. I found it in an article about they had on them having I'd adopted some kids. And I'm like, so then I started calling his firm and then got him. And that's how we connected. And it's just crazy to me. Then the way that we found out about her work before we contacted you all was flying over Harvard to Grace and finding any building with a flat roof. Because <laughs> Harvard to Grace is just like this little Victorian town. And that was the question I had for you. I mean, did you know of any controversy or, I mean, I, I mean, like now we embrace mid-century modernism, but I assume back then it was like, maybe people were aghast to see some of this stuff. Um, you know, I mean, I have a real appreciation for it because it's solid and it was built inexpensively so people could live, um, you know, families. She was concerned to get places for families that natural wood and lots of light. And so she had good intentions, but well, it may have been seen- we, we came to this time. country with, with, with no money, basically. So we lived in a little two bedroom stucco house that we rented. I think my mother convinced them to give us a year lease. Everything was month to month. And there were seven of us in this two bedroom with a, I remember when we got the little air conditioner in the corner and, um, you know, there was really no light pretty much. I mean, it was up, it was like living in a little tree house. And, uh, so we moved into that, that 715 Lewis Street, the duplex, half of that, that was our first home that we owned, that, that three bedroom duplex. Um, and as far as what people thought, well, they certainly thought that you couldn't build homes that way, but I'm sure uh, the biggest controversy that I remember actually was the medical arts building. So my mom did everything, everything had to do with proportion and aesthetics. So the lettering where it said medical arts building and then underneath that it said Gunther Hirsch MD was like maybe five inches, four inches, I don't know, six inches, whatever it was, it fit with the building. And at that time there was, I think you'll find this very funny knowing how doctors advertise these days, but advertising was not allowed by physicians. 
by the American Medical Association, and you could not have lettering on your building that was more than three inches high. I don't know why, because nobody would be able to see that if they had an ophthalmology problem, which is my field. But my mom went to the medical board, she says, but that's not aesthetics. You can't put three inches on that size of a wall. So it was like a big argument about how big the lettering could be on the wall. And she refused to put it at three inches. So that was that was a controversy that didn't come from the local public, but uh, just the way people thought in those days versus the way my mom thought. I also remember you mentioned the sauna, but my mom actually had a, um, a gym in the basement. I mean, no one had gyms back then, like an athletic club. So for $4, you could come and work out on the machines um, and take a sauna. But for $6, you could also use the local masseuse to get a massage. Um, but it went under because nobody, you know, nobody in that kind of a small community had ever heard of going to work out or taking a sauna or having a massage back in the early 60s. She's just a little ahead of her time in that <laughs> way. And I'm sure there were people in town that thought that that kind of architecture was, uh, you know, horrific. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know we're getting on to almost two and we can't go much further. I did want to say a big thank you um, to Traceries for doing all the work that they did. Um, and we are hoping actually to get another grant through the Maryland Historic Trust to continue the work and get other women's work uh, projects nominated. And um, so we're hoping to continue the collaboration. And is there any closing remarks you would like to say, John? I know you've we've, we've kind of been dominating here for the last few minutes. So if you want to get a plug in, this would be a great time. No. Uh other than to just, just to say thank you, uh, you know, for the opportunity to research and to learn about this amazing house and this great family, and it really has been a privilege. And I know it'll be one of the things we all remember as one of the highlights of our of our careers. So thank you so much. So everybody, uh, if you hadn't had a chance to see, Margaret did put up um, the the link where the uh, video will be posted when it, it goes up. And um, we hope to see you at the next virtual history or one of the upcoming events. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Thank you all. Thank you.